did a good job saying that too. Mm -hmm. 31 decisions in Memphis this week. Hi. Down there Thursday, Friday. And, uh, and God's so good, He blesses. And I get to talk to people, got to visit with a man. Noontime, just got on, on Wednesday. Uh, he got kicked out of Massachusetts. They didn't want him no more. He was in jail. They put him on a plane, sent him to Memphis because that was his hometown. Got off the plane at Memphis, didn't have any money. Didn't have social security, didn't have nothing. He's in a walker, wound up there at the homeless shelter. Friday night, he made a profession of faith. A whole life change really takes place in his life. God is so good. Tomorrow night, I run out to Topeka, Kansas, not too far out there, you know, a little ways. I've been out there. I used to, folks, it's the truth. My son played football at Baker University. I'd go watch him play. I'd drive home. There were times I got home, changed clothes, and went to church. You know, I'm not telling you my eyes were too bright and I was, wasn't was too with it, but I went to church and preached that day. But, uh, so I know the road. Uh, different car, the old car used to, had automatic pilot on it, just turn it loose and go home. You know, kind of like a horse, turn him loose, he'll go home. And, um, uh, but uh, I go out there, remember me in prayer, just out and back. These, these trips, uh, the only time I stay overnight is in Memphis. I don't even stay overnight in Dallas. I just go down and come back. So, uh, God, is, God is good and God is blessed uh, immensely, uh, that ministry. I want you to take your Bible and turn with me to Revelation. Chapter 2. And uh, find verse 18. Thyatira was the smallest town, the smallest church, uh, didn't have a lot going for it uh, that way. It, the town itself, set on a plane, didn't have a lot of security, and uh, But uh, it didn't have a lot of security. It was overthrown several times. But uh, it was a, a town that kind of let people know in Pergamus, hey, trouble's coming. And so the Romans, when they got the area, turned it into a military outpost and uh, served uh, under the Roman government that way. Uh, even though it's the shortest church, I mean, the smallest church in size, and the town's small in size, the text is not short. It's the longest text of any of the churches that Jesus talks to in the book of Revelation. And it's got more in it than he said to any of the other churches. So I want you to fasten your seatbelt, okay? And we're going to try to take a whirlwind tour through this text. And if we don't make it, we'll just saw it off and finish next week. But we're going to try to make it. So fast enough. Here we go. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, or love, a godly love and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last is more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman, Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach 
and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her the space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. And behold, I will cast her into a bed of them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins of the heart. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden but that which you already have, hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and as the vassals of the potter shall they be broken to shivers unto even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star, and he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Father, you know your word. Bless it. Strengthen it. Speak to our hearts. And Lord, uh, we need the enabling, illuminating presence of your Spirit to do in our midst what only he can do for your glory and for your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Christ, first of all, declares that he has eyes like flame. He sees. He sees everything that takes place in this church. There is nothing in that church of Thyatira that Jesus did not see. He saw everything in their lives, the intents of their heart. He saw that. And he saw the activity of that church. I just throw out this. And it's true. He sees everything that takes place here. Everything that's out in the open and everything behind closed doors. Everything that happens outside these four walls. He sees. He knows how we conduct ourselves. He knows our attitude when we get together. He knows it all. Jeremiah 16 verse 17 says, For my eyes are upon all their ways. They are not hid from my face. Neither is their iniquity hid from my eyes. You may think when you do something that nobody knows. And that may be very true. The only one that knows is you and the other person that are involved in whatever. <clears throat> but I'm here to tell you, God knows. Yeah. And folks, as I've gotten more mature, I have a greater fear of God knowing than anybody else knows. I have a greater fear of God knowing my life and what I would do or what I did than Chris knowing. Doesn't that be bad? She walked me upside the head. My son-in-law says when one night his his dad came home, liberated, and as soon as he opened the door. His mom hurled a stainless steel frying pan at his head. He was too drunk to stand upright. He fell over and it missed him. And Chris wouldn't have done that, but she'd come close. God knows. 
we need to understand he knows not only that, he says, I've got feet like fine brass, polished brass. There was a brass melt in Thyatira. And so they would have understood the solidness of brass, that it don't crush, it don't bend. It's heavy. And whatever his feet would step on would break in pieces, would shatter. His eyes speak of knowledge. His feet speak of judgment. And he's ready to judge this church. He's ready to judge those that are in the body. Now he has accommodation here for those in the church that are faithful. He said, first of all, I know what you do. I know, I know your activity. I know your ministry. He said, I know that you have love, charity, King James says. They use that for the word agape. Charity means I give you something. I, I'm open. I, I share with what I have with you and with those in need. He said, I know your love. You put legs to it. You do everything you can to love and care for people. I see that in the community where you are, Dr. Terry. I see it. I see your service, your table waiting, your faith, your patience, your endurance. And you don't got any quitting. <laughs> I can look at a basketball team, two of them playing on the court, and I can tell you within a few minutes which one's going to probably win. Because one team don't have any quitting, and the other team does. They'll quit. They get a little ahead, something doesn't go their way, they just quit. And they get beat. Jesus said, you ain't got to quit. Man, you hang in there. You go through the thick and the thin. You tied a knot in the end of the rope and hung on. He said, I know that. And he said, I, I realize that when you started out ministry and you started out doing things, it wasn't a whole lot. You kind of had to get your feet wet. Then you started winding up. And now, what you do is greater than what you begin to do. You're progressing. Man, if we're not progressing, we're going backwards. You cannot sit in neutral as a Christian or as a church. If you sit in neutral, you'll start sliding back. Because we're progressing up the hill, not down the hill, or not on a plateau. So we got to do better today and tomorrow than we have in the past. I, I know a lot of churches like to live in the past. Guess what? It's the past. You can't recover that. Impossible. How many got some things in their life that's in the past that you'd like to recover? Can I get a vote? Yeah. I imagine there's a few things in your past you'd like to not recover. Can we get a vote on that too? Come on, it's all right. We're family. I've said things and think, why did that come past my lips? Because once it's out, you cannot pull it back. Can't. You can't live in the past or let the past hold you back. You got to take what God gives you now and use it. And this church is doing that. One little sentence. He commends them. He pats them on the back. You're doing good there. 
But then man, he rips them up. <laughs> the rest of the text. He said, notwithstanding, I have a few things against you. Oh, when Jesus says, I got something against you, you better listen. He's not kidding. He sees. He knows. You inside and outside. I'm telling you, he knows things about you your spouse don't even know. And he knows things about you your best friend don't even know. Have I got a good friend in Ashland, Missouri, Earl Nance? I've told that man stuff I wouldn't tell anybody else. I've told him stuff I didn't even tell Chris. But he's told me stuff. He hasn't told his wife, Rebecca. Or his kids, or anybody else. But I'm telling you, there's things that God knows about us that we haven't communicated to one another. Now listen, when Jesus says, I have this against you, you had better pay attention. If you are convicted by the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, you better set up and take notice because God's doing something in your life. He gives here this against it. Uh, sad when God has to come to us in such strong ways, and God has done that before, and has a complaint. Two things. First of all, there's this woman, Jezebel. Now, most scholars, and I don't believe it's her real name, because better. Metaphors are used and illustrations are used to convey in the book of Revelation truth and a concept. If you want to know about Jezebel, just read 1 Kings chapter 16 through 22. You'll find out more about that woman than you ever want to know in your life. Ahab, son of Omri, became king and the Bible says right off the bat, he did evil in the sight of God. He married this woman named Jezebel. And she was a worshiper of Baal Peor. If you don't know who Baal Peor is, get your Bible and study it. They're terrible. Terrible. She brought prophets of Baal to the palace in Samaria. And they were fed and cared for. Elijah put the sword to them. <coughs> Sometimes you're around a man of God that has a prophetic call. And he's rough around the edges. It's because he has a prophetic call. He's like Elijah. He put the sword to people. That he had the chance. Jezebel. Wicked. Wicked. Ahab, he was a little puny wimp. He didn't have no backbone. He didn't have no intestinal fortitude. And whatever Jezebel said, yes, let's do that. Remember that orchard that he wanted, that grapevine that was in the family forever and ever? He said, I want to buy that. He said, no, can't do that belongs to my family. <clears throat> Isabel said, ain't no problem. I'll get it for you. She killed him. He took him. Wicked. When she died, they broke her through the streets. Did all kinds of things to her. Mutilated her body to some degree. And the dogs licked up her blood and ate some of the flesh. 
I kind of know a modern day Jezebel. I know more than one, but I'm just going to tell you about one. When they overthrew the dictator in Romania, the people actually hated his wife worse than they hated him. They both got ill treatment and abused, and killed, but his wife was drugged through the streets. They did all kinds of terrible things to her body. I'm telling you. Mutilated some of it. Dogs licked off blood that was spilled in the street. She was hated. I don't even think her husband loved her. He built himself a pink marble palace. I've seen it. It's a thing to see. You know what he built for her to live in? An old concrete building. Didn't even paint it. That's her house. He's in a pink marble with his concubines. I know. can't go any further or I'll get chasing rabbits. We gotta get this. Chasing battle. Second thing he said, she's there in the congregation. You know who she is. She thinks she's a prophetess. Which God said. When Paul wrote to Timothy, I suffer not a woman to lord it over the men. That does not mean she cannot be a Sunday school teacher. Does not mean that she can't be a music teacher. But it does mean she cannot be a pastor. Because all of these that are in positions are under the pastor and deacons in ministry. They're men over them. They're not over men. Lord it. She said, I'm a prophetess. God's called me to be a prophet. And I'm going to preach and teach and tell you just exactly what God wants you to know. He said, I've I got a problem with that. Now, if Jesus got a problem with it. It's a problem. He said, man, i got a problem. And he said, here's what she teaches. Number three. She seduces my servants. If you go to the Koine Greek, that word servants is uh, not servants. It's slaves. She teaches my slaves. But you and me. To commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now, listen, she's teaching them. They live in a community and in a city filled with guilds, all kinds. We would call them unions. Uh, Lydia from Thyatira was from, I mean, Lydia, who was saved in uh, Philippi by the river was from Thyatira. She was the, the person that traded and worked with purple dye, purple cloth. And there was a guild there of that because they got the purple dye from a root that grew around Thyatira. They had metalworks unions. They had all kinds of things. And all of these unions and all of these guilds had a patron saint. A God, patron God. And that patron God would be honored as they preached and taught in the community. And as they did, people were persuaded to come and be a part of them. They preached just like the, the converts preached about Jesus. Except they preached about their gods. They had their priests and priestesses. And a part of everything that was done when they had a, a union meeting, they would eat. 
they would have a thanksgiving offering given to their God, and, and those who were eating had a part of that. And then after they got ate, after they ate and had drank pretty good, a little bit too much, they would engage in fornication of all kinds. And she, and she was saying, well, that's all right. You can do that because if you don't, you're not going to get to eat. And they're going to they're going to cause you to lose your job. Things aren't going to go good. You may be on the street. And so she stood up the church and she compromised this doctrine with Christianity. She opened up the door for a permissive attitude. And she really pushed that attitude in the congregation. Jezebel was wicked and evil. She was a seducer. She accomplished whatever she wanted to accomplish. And she, Jesus said, this lady is just like her. And the church and the pastor tolerated it. And they should have never tolerated it. He said, I gave her time to repent. I mean, he could have squashed her out right off the bat. But he didn't. He loves everybody. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what your past is. I don't care what your present activity is. Jesus Christ loves you. And he's more willing to forgive you than hurt you. He's more willing to love you than send you to hell. Because he died on the cross for you. He shed his blood for you. He laid down his life for her. He laid down his life for her. He, he said, I gave her space to repent. And she didn't want to repent. He said, I'll cast her on a bed. A sick bed. One of the things that was prevalent in that culture was diseases that were connected have a narrow diseases let's get it we're all adults and some of those uh, syphilis and some of those brought death they had they didn't have penicillin they didn't have those kind of things that we have today and people died he said I'm gonna let her come in contact with that she'll die if she don't repent he said those who commit adultery are gonna have the same problem if they don't repent. How many have been in the military in here? You know what that's like. There's people all the time going down to the doctors, down to the medics, because they've got in trouble. He said that's going to happen to those who are a part of her. And they're going to be a big sickness now. And then he says, I will kill her children with death. And we think he's talking about her offspring. But one of the things that scripture uh, teaches that we are followers of the disciples of someone. And in that culture, you were also called, called a child of someone if you was the disciple of that person. And I really think what he's saying here is those who are children, followers of her, those who bought into her false doctrine, those who practice what she's saying instead of what Jesus said through the apostles and through the preacher that's there, if he's preaching the word of God, they're going to die because they're going to catch the same thing she's got. Because that spreads like gangrene in a group that has free, open activity. Wow. He says, I search the reins, the thoughts, the mind. I search the heart, the will, the emotions. 
I look at the inner man. I look at what people can't see. I see who you really are. And he said, I'm going to deal with you according to who you are. Sometimes that makes my knees know. I don't know about you guys. But he does it in grace and love. Not to crush us, not to condemn us, but to make us better. Right? I hope when you corrected your children, you did so to make them better. Right? You didn't want them to go the other way. You wanted them to be better. So you corrected them. He corrects us so we'll be better. We'll shine better. He takes the scuff marks off of our personality and our inner man. There's a few scuff marks I've had you need to take off. <clears throat> Notice in this process, He says in verse 24, those who haven't compromised don't get blessed. I say to the rest, as many as have not this doctrine and which have not known the deep of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you no other burden but that which you have already hold to. I'm not going to lay anything else on you. That's enough to take care of her. If you take care of false doctrine. You see, when they were participating in the union parties, it was leading them to honor deities that were not God. They were the demons, false gods, idols. Now, we don't have that in our culture, but we do have jobs and money and positions and possessions and children and activities and spouses. And we have all kinds of things that can become an idol to us. we got to be careful how we do it. He says here in the last part, You know, he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. You get to bring them with him, with a, like a rod arm. You get to crush the nations during the millennium and all eternity. We reign with Christ. What a blessed hope he holds out here. We get to reign with him. Amen. That's fantastic. We're there. We don't belong there. Shouldn't be there. But by his grace and by his mercy, we're there. So what do we take away? Well, first of all, you got to continue doing ministry. I mean, you got to kick it in gear. It doesn't matter how tired you get. It doesn't matter how run down you get. You still got to do ministry. You've got to Wait on tables. You gotta care about the family. You gotta love the family. You gotta do. You gotta be faithful. You gotta hang in there. You gotta dig your heels in. I ain't moving. You always gotta guard the doctrine of the church. It is teaching. Because Satan is doing everything he can to corrupt the church. And he will until he is destroyed by being sentenced for eternity in hell. He's going to infiltrate it with people. They're going to look good, sound good, smell good, but they're not going to be good. Okay? So you've got, you got to have your ears out. You've got to have your eyes. You've got to have, you know, those antennas like on the Martin up so you catch that false stuff running around. And deal with it. Don't just say, well, you know, it's not good teaching. 
Whack it off. Throw it out. God wants that to be there. And do understand, no matter how good you are, if you don't repent of wrongdoing, God will deal with you. Man, I have been in more woodsheds than we got time to talk about. I don't like it. But I'm stubborn as a mule about some things. And it gets me in trouble sometimes. This quote is not my original. Leonard Ravenhill. Anybody know Leonard Ravenhill? Evangelist. Old time evangelist. Prophet of God, I believe. He come from England, United States. He didn't get married till he was late 60s, early 70s, something like that. And uh, he preached. He preached. He preached a color right out of these panels. Let me tell you, on the wall. On his tombstone is this quote. I've seen it. I just want to know what are you living for? <coughs> really? What Christ shed his blood for? Is it worth it? And I kind of put it together. Just want to know what you're living for. Is it really worth what Christ died for? And you better take on that and that care you will. And I ask myself that two or three times a day. If I'm driving down the road, it's usually two or three times whatever mileage I'm putting in. And he's God, God, I don't want to do something anymore. Because I've done so much, it's not worth the blood of Christ. I don't want to be there. I don't want to stand before him with a life lived and finished. It's not worth what he died for. The church needs to ask itself that question as a body. What are we doing? Is it really worth the blood that Christ has shed? You're going to hear me ask that question many more times. I got under conviction driving six hours home. You may say, you ain't taking no more church now, buddy. <laughs> but I did. I got under conviction that I need to not just ask myself, but I need to ask others. Is what you're doing, how you live in your life, really worth the blood of Christ shed for you? I hope it is.